this week's clinical file, we have Ricardo, and Ricardo is preparing a plan of care for a 10-year-old child with cerebral palsy. The patient is classified as a level four on the gross motor function classification system or scale, also known as the GMFCS. Which of the following activities is the most appropriate? So we have A, standing balance and coordination activities. We have B, which is great gait training using a post-tier walker. C is stair climbing using handrails. And D is wheelchair fitting for posture and pressure relief. All right. So. This is definitely a common type of pediatric outcome measure type of question. You got to know these outcome measures really well in order to get down to the answer with confidence. All right. So let's break this one up. It says Ricardo is preparing a plan of care uh, for a 10 year old child with cerebral palsy. So let's go ahead and take note of that. First of all, right, the 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 age of the child's 10 years old um, and they have cerebral palsy. Now, for those of you who are going through your neuromuscular type of studying right now, you know that cerebral palsy is related to more of an upper motor neuron lesion, all right? Children oftentimes can get this for different reasons. It could be something more related genetically, uh, but most of all, something related to some type of uh, anoxic brain injury, lack of blood flow to the brain um, during birthing or anything along the lines of their earlier years in life leading to cerebral palsy. All right. So we look at it as a upper motor neuron condition and there's all different types of cerebral palsy. All right. Uh, one of the most common ones is spastic diplegic cerebral palsy. And that's the one I would prepare for on the MPTE. It doesn't say anything like that in this question though it just says 10 years old and cerebral palsy okay so let's continue down the question it says the patient is classified as a level four on the gross motor function classification system or scale so i'm going to go ahead and highlight that right now i want to slow up for a moment so we need to understand what the heck that this means so when we have a patient who has a motor disability all right, when we have a child with a motor disability, oftentimes we'll use this thing called the GMFCS. It's a classification scale, right? So where we classify the child based upon their motor disability. And so we use it oftentimes with something like cerebral palsy or even Down syndrome, um, we can use this scale as well, okay? And so we classify the person based upon their usual performance, meaning that we want to classify what the child does regularly, not what they're capable of from a motor perspective, but what they do regularly, all right? And so there's different levels and level one is, let me give you an example. Level one is more of your independent ambulator. You know, more of your level two is a, a child that ambulates independently in most environments, but will tend to need some type of assisted advice, you know, if they're going longer distances or something along the lines of that. Um, and so you can see that as we get closer to, let's say, a level two, three, four, five, it gets just more severe where the child may even be in a, like, confined to a wheelchair, needed to be pushed to one location to the next. They're pretty much confined to that wheelchair. That's a more of a level five, okay? So it gets more severe as we go along. Now, in the question, it's it says the patient is classified as a level four on this scale. The question stem. It says, which of the following activities is the most appropriate? For those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answer choice again. We got A, it says standing balance and coordination activities. B is gait training using a post-tier walker. C is stair climbing using handrails. And D is wheelchair fitting for posture and pressure relief. All right. So here's the thing. In order for you to get this question correct, we just need to really understand what is the question asking. The question's asking which really which one of the activities would we be doing for a patient that's classified as a level four on the GMFCS? So 
let's say, for instance, if the child was confined, this is hypothetical right now, let's just say the child was confined to a wheelchair, right? And they couldn't stand, they couldn't walk or do anything like that. Would we do things like standing balance and coordination activities with them? Absolutely not, okay? It just doesn't make sense. And so that's the type of understanding that you have to have in order to get this question right with confidence. So let's start breaking down each answer choice. A says standing balance and coordination activities. Would I do this with a child that's classified as level four on the scale? The answer to that is, is no. You wanna know why? Well, it's kind of for the reasons that I've already told you. A, a child who's at level four, they're spending the majority of their time in more of a powered wheelchair. All right. And so they're not someone who's independently ambulating, moving around their their uh, environment freely, even doing a lot of standing based activities solo. Right. And so standing balance and coordination activities, it's like, nah, I really wouldn't want to do that. Now, I could do that with a child who's maybe a level one who has balance and coordination difficulties or deficits. A level one, we could do it with. A level two, we could do it with because they're still standing and ambulating independently for short distances and all. So we can still do that for level one, level two, maybe even level three here. But, 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 but for a level four, it's just not, it's not valuable. All right. And so let's go ahead and get rid of A. Let's go down to B. B says gate training using a post tier walker. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen a post here walker before. If you haven't, definitely look it up on Google. It's really um, it's really interesting to, to look at because we're so used to seeing it right in the front. Um, but look at the post here walker and look at why we use one. And you'll see that oftentimes if you have a patient with cerebral palsy and they're using a post here walker, a lot of times it's a younger child, right? A lot of times it's a younger child. And we're talking about two, three, four, along in that, that zone right there. But this child in the question is 10 years old and they have a level four. Okay. Again, level fours spend the majority of their time in, in the powered wheelchair. All right. And so it's like, do we want to gate train a patient with a post tier walker? It's like, ah, so first of all, it's not likely that they'll be using that device. And second, that's not the most effective thing to do with a patient who has this severe of cerebral palsy or is affecting them at this level. So let's go ahead and get rid of B. It's just not appropriate. It's not the most effective. Let's continue down. Stair climbing using handrails. Is that something that I want to do with this child? Well, let's think back to it. We said a level four. That's someone that's using a power wheelchair, somebody that's requiring physical uh, assistance in order to get around, all right? Um, so my question to you is, do we want to start training this patient to like do stair climbing using handrails? Mm, probably not. The child's going to require a lot of assistance to get up and down the stairs and to try to teach them to do it by themselves with a handrail. It's just not effective. Now, can I do that? with maybe some of your other levels, level one. Well, level one can go up and down the stairs with no problem, y'all. Write that down on your nose, baby. A level one on the GMFCS, they can go up and down the stairs independently, no problem. So I wouldn't even train a level one with this, okay? But maybe a level two, yeah. They have a little bit of difficulty getting up and down the stairs where they need the handrail. So maybe a level two, maybe even a level three. All right, but a level four, absolutely not. Why? Because they, these children, no matter how much you try to help them, they just don't have the motor abilities, the regular motor ability in order to get up and down the stairs. All right, regardless of whether you use a handrail. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of X, or get rid of X, get rid of C. I'm gonna put an X next to C, how about that? Is, is that cool if I do that? Okay, <laughs> let's look at D. D says wheelchair fitting for posture and pressure relief. And if you've been following me up to this point, I guess that you have a really nice understanding now of, or at least a picture of a level four, that they spend in a lot of their time in what? a powered wheelchair or some type of wheelchair, right? Do you think it's important for us to do wheelchair fitting for this patient? 
you know, to make sure that their posture is correct, that we're not worried about pressure sores and contractures, and we're trying to reduce the risk of all these different things. Absolutely, it makes sense. The patient is gonna spend the majority of their time in a wheelchair. So you better be fitting this wheelchair to them. You better be fitting it for their posture and for pressure relief. Absolutely love it. It makes the most sense. D is our best answer. That's it, baby. D wheelchair fitting for posture and pressure relief congratulations to those of you who got this one correct uh, listen pediatric outcome measures if this is not your ballpark if this is not your your thing that you like to study or look at this is difficult for you i'm in the same department my wife crushes information like this actually before i was coming in here to train you all she was like hey you know make sure that they know that there's a difference between the GMFM, how many of y'all have ever heard that? GMFM, gross motor function measure, all right? There's a difference between the GMFM and the GMFCS. Well, what's the difference? The GMFM is the actual test that you do. It's the test that you do. But what we're talking about today, the GMFCS is the scale that we use to classify. So we do the test first, and then we use the scale to classify them. Does that make sense? We gotta get the objectivity first, and then we use the scale to classify. So there are two different things, but they kind of go together a bit, all right? So don't get confused. If you ever seen one and not the other or whatnot, well, at least you know what these letters mean and what they, what they mean to each other, all right? So, I mean, if this is not your forte here, what I suggest that you do is not study it all at one time, but start breaking this stuff up over time. Let's start bringing in a little bit of the outcome measures when you're learning cerebral palsy. This is your opportunity to learn this. This is your opportunity to go over it. You don't have to do it every day. But when you're learning these neuropathology, especially the peds ones, make sure you add in a little bit of the outcome measures in there as well. All right. Now, I hate to leave you with that. I'm not going to leave you with that. For those of you on the podcast right now, if you're on iTunes, if you're on Spotify, wherever you are, if you can find the show notes for this episode right here, what I did was I created a cheat sheet that has what you need to know about the GMFCS. All right, I broke down the levels for you. I broke down what the child's supposed to be able to do at each level, the descriptions. So it's all in there for you. All right, so go into the show notes, click the link in there and get it. 